Magic. That'd be my one. Yep. I know I'll write down anything that I'm interested in. You know, if I see a good picture of a fish, um, and I know it's a nice venue, and I've got a list. It was just my sort of carp, you know, it had all the looks, it had age to it, a little bit of history about it. The moment I saw a picture of that fish, it got added straight to the list of possible adventures. The lake's a big part of it as well. You know, it's not, not only the fish that's got to make a picture, it's got to be everything, you know, that, uh, you've got to enjoy fishing there. It's got to make a good memory, you know, and, and it, I knew it was going to be somewhere I'd like fishing. More than anything, because it was quiet, not too many other anglers. Plus, it was my cup of tea, you know, a little low stock of carp, small family of fish, uh, one or two big ones. Other than that big old chocolate coloured mirror, I knew of a couple of good commons as well. So I had two big fish in mind, uh, and as it turned out, there was one or two others as well. So I know an important part of your approach, Tell, is you know, to, to do reckeys around the venue before you fish it. Tell us a little bit about that, like you know, what time you go, etc. First light, got to be there for first light. My first reckeys were through, like I say earlier, January, February time. Um, so it's not like I had to get up extra early, you know, it doesn't get light until sort of seven, half past seven. And over the years, I've always got into a habit of making myself a flask, the same old flask that I've had for God knows how long and I've got a little rucksack, a um, little recce rucksack. So yeah, I'll take a flask, I'll take my iPad, um, because a big part of that early morning recce has actually already come the evening before. You know, if I'm going for a walk about first thing in the morning, I would have been studying that aerial, aerial Google Earth image of it beforehand. And then once I'm there, you know, maybe in the, the evening before, I might have looked at a swim. Right, you've got a boarded swim here. Uh, I can see there's a big plateau out there at maybe 100 yards or something, and that lines up with that tree over there. Well. Once you're, there, once you're there at ground level, water level, it's very hard to see that. So you want the image there, you know, the Google image there in front of you, not just a memory. So I'd imagine you find those early reckeys mega exciting. Yeah. Oh yeah, I look forward to it. I don't have trouble getting up to the alarm call, put it that way. You know, I was first walking it in January, but I had no intentions of fishing until April. Don't get me wrong, I had choddies all ready to go, I had a little batch of tutti fruity pop-ups rolled. You know, if I'd seen a display, if I was that lucky, you know, at that time of year, it would have been lucky as well. But if, I see, if I'd seen any sort of a display out there, then I would have been back. Uh, but I didn't. As it happens, I saw absolutely nothing all the way through the winter. I saw two tents clip the surface in early March. That was the first sign that I saw. But, and I was surprised in a way, because I knew that the lake had a big head of bream. But it was a cold winter, you know, a um, lot of cold winds ripping across it as well. And it wasn't until, in fact, when I started, actually started fishing the lake in April, I was still pretty much blind. It's funny because traditionally the time to start was always April. You know, that's when things are improving. But, you know, as there's more carp anglers about, I don't know, maybe I'm even keener. But, but that, that starting point has become earlier and earlier and earlier as the years have gone on. And, uh, you know, what you've got to think is you've got, you've got three main carp fishing seasons in the year. You know, your spring, your summer and your autumn. Yeah, we can catch them in the winter, but that's the hardest time. You know, and say for instance, if I started on a lake in October, and everything's going the other way then. You know, whereas if I start in spring, it's getting better. It's got a future. You know, so anything that I find, you know, any little dusted off spots in the edge or clear areas out in the open, I know it's got a future to it. Whereas if you can find those same spots towards the end of the summer or in the autumn months, then you know that it's, it's a case of, uh, it's a race against time, time's running out. So you've got to stick to those three seasons and you want the most of it. So April's the perfect time to start. It's not so much uh, looking for fish, it's getting a feel for the place and you know, I, I like the rugged nature of, the, of it as well. You know, uh, there's a lot of horses around there, all in the fields, all, all surrounding it. Um, so a lot of the branches, a lot of the, a lot of the foliage and a lot of the tree line at, at, at horse level was destroyed, smashed. You know, they were always rubbing up against it, scratching themselves. Um, but you know what, that made it open to the wind because there was very little protection at that level. And that was what struck me from the off, was just how open and, and affected by those winds that it was. 
I, I could barely find any protected water. If there was a big wind blowing on that lake, there was nowhere that really sort of jumped out at you as the place to be. It hit pretty much everywhere on that lake. So I'm guessing over the years, most of the fish you've sort of angled for, you know, targeted if you like, most of them you've caught. But do you ever have any sort of like doubts? doubts? Like this one, you know, this one's going to be a tricky one or, or whatever, you know? I'll be honest, if, if any doubts, the, the doubts that you have are, you know, aren't so much about whether you're going to catch it, it's about the time frame that you're going to catch it in, you know. Um, that's why the looks of the fish is so important to me. It's got to be one that really, really does it for you because you've got to be able to see, see out the, the, you know, as long as it takes. Um, you know, ideally, you want to be able to do it in one set of seasons, your spring, summer, autumn, winter. But you don't know, you might be going through to a second set, maybe even a third set, you know, like three years. So, so you've, got to, you've got to really, really want to catch it. And that's, that's um, something that I, I make sure it's, it's one that I definitely, definitely want to catch from the very off. You know, at this point, I still had absolutely nothing to go on, no signs at all, other than slightly, and I mean ever so slightly, calmer water off the back of the wind. You know, at that time of the year, the carp nearly always get out of those cold winds. So I went round there on a hunch, more than anything. But I just put choddies out and felt for drops. Bright ones on each rod, tooty fruities. Spread them out across the open water, basically on the wind line, if you like, you know, off the back of the wind. I think I'd done two nights there, no signs at all. But on that second day in that swim, I walked down to my left in a corner, you've got a bay, and there's a lot of shallower features in that bay. But in the, right, in the, right in the corner of that bay is a pipe, and it, you could tell it had been dry for years, you know. But we had high water levels, the Thames runs right alongside it, and we had real, real high flood water at that time, and there was the slightest of trickles coming in. I mean tiny, just a little trickle of water coming in, a tiny little bit of coloured water, and it just, just, just looked likely. So, I, and I had some casters with me, casters and a bit of emp while I was walking around. So I waded out in my chest waders, found a couple of likely looking areas and just sprayed a little bit. Not a lot, you know, um, I don't know, probably a handful of casters and a couple of handfuls of hemp, just along this same little strip of margin. Uh, second night out in, that, out in that deep open water with the singles, no joy at all. Woke up in the morning, so I left it probably an hour or so. And I took a stroll down there. And the first thing I noticed, you've got to remember, only the day before in the afternoon, I'd, been, I'd sprayed that little bit of hemp and casters there. And the water at that time was tap clear, crystal clear. You could see everything, every little strand of weed, all the little spots that had been dusted off. I had no doubt they'd already been in there at some point. But I walked down there. Instead of, instead of being able to see the bottom, it was just chocolate all the way through there. I couldn't see anything. Couldn't see any fish, didn't, couldn't see anything. And I, I ended up getting the best view I could along this strip of margin and I was watching for probably 10 minutes or more, and all the birds were there as well. They know where to shower off the back of the wind as well. Always a good sign. And while I'm watching, something just flopped out amongst the birds. And I walked up there, had a little, little closer look, still really coloured. But you know, the first thing I saw, the first carp I saw was a white one. Not really my cup of tea, it was a koi carp. A koi carp, white one, probably about, I don't know, 12 or 14 pound, with an orange dot on his head. And that was enough for me. You know, he was obviously the fawn in that side. Within probably five minutes of spotting that one, then I'd seen another one, a darker shape. Then I saw one out to the left. You know, when you're looking, you're looking through coloured water and I'm just looking at this dark shape and I thought, well, is that a rock or a boulder? And as you're looking at it, you see that, no, that's definitely moving, that's definitely moving. It was changing in size and shape. Packed up in double quick time and moved straight down there. Those fish were close in, so I sat up well back from the edge, put my old chest waders on, so there was one bit, just so that there was a couple of snags that went out and uh, I had one spot earmarked straight away where I'd seen that white one and it was a little bit deeper there. That was the first rod, I lowered one in there, I put a tiny little bit of bait around it, just a little, literally a pinch of hemp around it, double tiger on the hair and then you had this snag that went out and until the left of that it was a little bit shallower and for there I wanted the chest waders just to be able to wade out that little distance but obviously I'm trying my hardest not to spook anything. And I watched for a little, by now I'm aware that there's a few more fish there than just those first two that I've seen. You know, I'm aware there's at least seven or eight fish in, the, in this particular bay. And uh, I put my old chesties on, took a couple of steps out into the lake. As soon as the coast was clear, I couldn't see anything at that point. And I'm looking, I'm searching for the best bits, but like I say, there's a little bit of colour in the water. It wasn't easy. I could see there because it was a bit shallower. But while I'm looking, all of a sudden, two or three appeared from the left. 
and I'm out there already, it's too late, you know, I can't take a step back or anything. And there's no cover behind me either, pretty open. But I've got the rod in my hand, I just had to freeze. And there was one in particular, it was a fat one, big fish, common. And it crawled right the way up the ledge, probably, I don't know, only five or six foot in front of me. It was like it couldn't even see me, you know, but it was feeding, I could see its lips going and everything. But I had to wait until it turned away. I suspect it did see me in the end, but it didn't spoke, it wasn't sure. You know, is that a tree? Or is that a geezer stood there with a rod? But it just waddled off out, and as soon as it waddled off out, I lowered in where it was. Again, tiny little bit of, of emp around it, a couple of chew tiger nuts, threw them around it, and then I was out of there. And all the time you're cringing, aren't you? You don't even want to be seen, you know? But yeah, I got out, I've got two traps set, stuck the kettle on, and I've got my bed well back as well, you know, like trying to keep it stealthy. You know when you're really confident, you know it's gonna go. I'd say half hour, 40 minutes, did it, did it, and the old tip was bouncing. You would expect from that close in that it'd belt off, you know, you'd think you're gonna get a melting run, you know, especially in a big pit. Big pit fish tend to, you know, they've got an habit of they'll strip 50, 60 yards of line off you and then you lead them in like a dog on a lead. That's normal with big pit carp. But this one didn't. It was almost a, a tenchy type of bite, you know, the old tip was bouncing, did it, did it, did it, and the tip's, what's going on? And I picked up the rod and it just comes straight up to the surface. Half asleep still, and I literally just just walked straight out and bundled it bundled it into the net. I doubt if I had it on a minute. First week of April, first trip, twenty-seven pounder, and that one was a looker. You know, I could see it was of a good size as well. Uh, I put him on the mat, lifted him onto the scales, twenty-seven pound and a couple of ounces. Good start, first trip. I think that was probably about 5th or 6th of April, so nice and early. Got all spring ahead of me, and I've nabbed one on my first trip. You can imagine my confidence is through the roof. This ain't going to be too difficult, you know. Spring was a long time in coming. Hopefully that's it, here to stay now. Lots more carp on the way. Big kiss, first carp from the lake. Back you go. As much as that little trickle of water coming out of the Thames had an influence, and I've no doubt it did, you know, I've seen that many times before. You get a fresh, fresh tasting flow of water coming into a lake and those carp will be there. No matter how big the pit, they taste it and they're there straight away. But there was more to it than that flow of water. Since the middle of March on those walkabouts, I'd been noticing more and more caddis in the edge. No doubt they must start off in the deeper water and then climb up the ledge as, as uh, the spring progresses and as the light levels increase, you know. They're case caddis, they're, they're yet to hatch. But by the time I'd started fishing there, you know, that particular trip was when it became most noticeable. Those margins all along that part of that, part of that bay were just heaving with caddis, you know. Every rock, every boulder, every stone, a lot of half house bricks and uh, old building rubble all along that edge. And everything was just covered in caddis you know, all little sticks. It's always been about the caddis. It's just, it wasn't probably until about 10 years ago that I recognised it. And the first time I realised it, that was April, exactly the same time of the year. And it was on the Ellis. And I remember catching a 35 pounder, real nice one, big single scale on its flank. And I slipped it into a sack. And when I got out of the sack, there was loads of them, like a pile of sticks I got out of this sack. And the thing with caddish, you know, you'll get, um, you know, they'll use whatever, whatever substrate they've got around them, you know. Sometimes they'll make, make little cases out of stones, uh, but these ones were sticks. That's what they look like anyway, little dark pieces of stick. And I'm sure a lot of people would, wouldn't even recognise what they are. But every one of those little bits of stick has got a maggot in it, a little bug in it. And when you think, you know, to some of the best baits, best carp foods, hemp seed, casters, you know, more recent one, that one. But, They've got a crunch to them. They've got a pop, a crunch, and a load of guts come flying out, you know, just like naturals do. And I'm sure that's why some of these baits, like your hemp, like your casters, that's why I can't find them so irresistible. They match their natural food, or they're as close as you're going to get to it. I'd made my mind up by this time. It was all going to be about the edge for me. That was going to be my number one plan, you know, so I did, really didn't want to do too much in the open water, only when I had to. Uh, so there was little in the way of plumbing, you know, I just, all I had to do was keep my eyes open for the fish and concentrate on getting choddies out in those, in those areas wherever I saw any activity. So you mentioned Chodrig's tail. I know it's an approach you certainly don't use as much as you used to. Why is that? 
just because they're heavily used now, you know, all over the place. I think, I think once upon a time I could go to a lake and I'd know that odds on I'd be the first one casting them out, you know, in the early years. Because um, at the end of the day, the hinge rig and the chod rig, it's the same hooking arrangement, you know, it's just one's fished out the leader and one's fished on a boom. But they're used a lot more heavily now. They'll always, always have a place in my, my rig armoury, if you like, you know, because there is a time and a place for them. If I go somewhere uh, that's, that's barely been fished, first, first approach is always going to be the hinge rigs and the chod rigs. But on a lake like this, I knew they had been fished for in the past. Uh, they had had a little bit of pressure. And ideally, I'd rather be using something that they hadn't been fished for with before, you know. But uh, when it comes to fishing single hook baits, you know, you're not, you're not fishing to a marker float, you're not putting bait out there, it's just a single, single hook bait, exactly where you've seen fish going. And you're, and you're not, uh, not particularly aware of what the bottom's like. You know, it might be a little bit weedy there, and then there might be a clean spot there. But at least the choddy would be fishing on all of it. And when you've got three of them spread out there as well, it's odds on that at least one or two of them are going to be right. Whereas years ago, I would have only put a bottom bait out when I felt that it was too clean for a pop-up. Now it's pretty much the other way around, and I'll go out of my way, you know, to, to, to fish a bottom bait if I can. Uh, I'm talking more when I'm fishing over bait, and the only time I tend to put a pop-up on now is when I know that I have to. I don't know how many are in this lake, but just from the short, short amount of time I've been here so far, I mean, I walked it a bit through the winter. This is, what, my third, fourth trip this spring. It's clear it's a real low stock, or it's low stock compared to the size of the pit, you know? And when it's a low stock, it's all the more important to be right where the fish are. You know, you're going to have large areas of waters with water with nothing in at all. And I knew I got it wrong yesterday evening. I got down, set up. The wind was variable, you know, and, I, and it was, felt cold, so I sort of chose off the back of it a bit. But by morning, it had swung round, and what did feel nice felt horrible. But I was up real early, first light, and there was just a little bit of calm water on the other side of the lake. And I see one come out three times on the trot three times and then after that I had the binoculars on the calm water and then I see another one lop out that was it half past six in the morning and I'm I've barely had one cup of tea and I'm wrapping up barrel all the way around here put uh, I pretty much knew where I wanted to be so I was sort of setting up my kit get got the rods ready uh, I left the same baits on that had been out all night on the other side of the lake they were all still all right and uh, while I was putting up all my kit I see another one show then another one so like I put one choddy out there, got an half decent drop. I put the old stop well up the leg core anyway, because I didn't really want to be having more than, a, more than one chuck of each rod, you know? But I got a decent drop on that. One to the left of it, one to the right of it by a few feet. They landed a bit soft, but I was happy. Hour later, off it melted. And I know, what I do know, is there's very few mirrors in the lake, but I've got one. Reminds me of the old corral swim. The roots in the crowd, that's where our sacked old basil up. He'll do, won't he? I've been told there's only four or five mirrors in here. So either he's one of them, or he's one that no one knows. We'll find out later. I'll tell you what, it was good to get a mirror as my second bite. You know, there's very few of them in there, only five or six. And obviously the main prize is a mirror. So if I catch one of the mirrors, then you, you pretty much know that, you, that if you can catch that one, then there's a good chance of getting the big and the all. It's just a matter of time. Just got to stick at what I was doing. It was a good and an all, real nice looker. Uh, 27 pounds and ounces, same sort of size. I think it was an ounce bigger than the common. It's a good fight as well, that fish. In fact, I, I've got to be honest, like when it first surfaced and that old dorsal come out and I saw that line of scales along the back, it was shady where I was playing it. We had big, big overhanging trees, so it was all quite dark and shady. And I was stood out in the lake and it surfaced and I had about another two or three minutes playing it after that. And yeah, in the back of my mind, I was unsure. It's one of them where you're, you know, your 55th, was that, was, is that the big mirror or, or, or another mirror like, you know? All I knew is I definitely, definitely didn't want to lose that one because I just wasn't sure. I'd seen fish showing in that same area where I caught that 27 several times. In fact, uh, 
And if I was chuffed to have caught one mirror, then I was even more chuffed when the very next bite, the third fish out of the lake, was yet another mirror. You know, remember there's only five or six of them in there, so every mirror was, was you just felt like that much closer to the big one. But it, it wasn't a mirror I was expecting, you know, uh, if, if it was a younger one, you know, a younger strained fish, uh, probably a simo, I would have said. You can always tell from the, from the face, can't you, the head, it's like, haven't I seen you somewhere before? You know what they're like, you know, you can always tell. I suspect that that fish had probably made its way in from the, from the Thames in, uh, in those big floods, 2013, 14. But yeah, not big one, um, 19 pound. Um, and even though it was a younger fish, you know, it's still taken on nice colours like they all do when they're in a big clear pit. You know, he, he was quite dark uh, and everyone was welcome. You know, I think he was just under 20 pound, 19 pounds an ounces. So yeah, he was, he was welcome. Um, even if he wasn't quite of the age of, of the main target, you know what I mean? He was still a nice one. All, all that chodding, that was, it was all about, because was, there was little choice. You know, if, if it was warm enough for the margins, then that's what I would have been doing. It was all the edge stuff that I was most interested in. All the time I was doing that chodding out in the open, I was still keeping my eyes on the margins. And, and I was forever, like, whatever swim I was in, fishing the open, I'd be walking left and right along the margins in my chest waders. Um, and I'd take my mark rod with me and any little sticks and any debris on the bottom. If you had a nice little spot, oh, that's a nice little sandy spot there, and there was a stick ground across it, then I'd sort of get the old rods here and just ping them out of the way, you know. I was creating all my spots. It was all about looking for the future and knowing what was going to come. You know, like I said earlier, uh, at that time of the year in the spring, everything's got a future. And it's just being aware What's, what's, what's to come, you know, as, as the uh, spring turns to summer. And one of the main areas that I had in mind was the pipes. At the time, there was still a little bit of trickle, trickle of water coming through there. Nowhere near enough for the fish to, to travel from one side to the other. They couldn't get through it. Uh, but they could taste the difference. You know, if you had um, a northerly blowing, which would blow into the pipes from the other side of the motorway, on my side, on the south side, it wasn't the sort of condition you'd expect them to be there. You know, you think, well, it's off the back of the wind, it's cool conditions. But you have to remember that there was the, that wind battering into the pipes from the other side, that was creating a little push of water through the tunnels, almost like several rivers flowing through. Only very shallow, and it was only a slight push, but enough to, to get a chum line going out into the lake, you know, any flotsam and that would be going out into the lake. And when it was like that, even when it was cooler, those fish would turn up there virtually every single time. Those tunnels were a big part of it. I, I suspect that the main spawning grounds were in the other lake in the north. And if you imagine you've got a trickle of water coming through or just a little bit, those carp can taste it. You know, they can taste the hormones, they can taste what the other, they, they can taste their mates the other side, they know where they are. And in past years, you know, they're not, old, they're not young fish, they're old fish, so they've been in there a long time and they would have been used to travelling back and forth regularly, you know, at will, whenever they wanted. But that water had been dry through those tunnels or, or virtually dry for like two, three years now. But even when the water level, because it dropped a lot over the course of the spring and summer, it kept dropping. Ultimately, it must have dropped three to four foot over, over time. But even once there was no water trickling through those tunnels, they, it was still a carp magnet to them, you know, they still went there. There's at least three fish down there. All troughing on caddis, no doubt. I figured that if conditions were right, you had a bright sunny day, you know, decent, decent temperatures of 18, 20 degrees plus, uh, and a gentle breeze blowing in there, then that's when they would turn up. And a lot of the time I was right, they would turn up in those conditions. What I didn't or couldn't predict was how they'd suddenly turn up there in the conditions that you just wouldn't be expecting them. And, uh, so whereas I started off by only dropping in there when I'd expect them to turn up, it didn't take long before I'd be fishing somewhere else on the other side of the lake in the open, and then I'd take a stroll around there, off the back of the wind, it might not even be 10 degrees, and they'd be there. Like, you know, or, or um, you'd move out in the afternoon, think, well, it's night time now, you know, like it was definitely more of a daytime area. I'd expect them to turn up in the afternoons more than I would in the mornings or the nights. But then you'd just like take a walk around there at first light, and you'd see one of the big ones there, troughing, you know, exactly on the same spot that you'd seen them before. And that, that 
that's when it really got to me. That was when it made me realise just how, how significant that corner was. It didn't matter what the conditions was doing, you could never truly rule it out. They could turn up there really randomly at any time. Even when they did turn up, getting them to drop and feed on bait was, it just seemed impossible. You know, they were just so, at first I couldn't make my mind up because when they was there and when they did feed, they'd colour it up so you, you couldn't see as well. And at first I wasn't sure if it was a rig thing, you know, maybe, maybe I've got to change something here. But over time I, I began to realise it wasn't a rig thing at all, it was natural food. They were going there, if they fed there, most of the time I think they were going there in the hope of travelling through to the other side. Um, but like I say, even, even when they couldn't, even when there was no water through those pipes, they'd still go there anyway. And, but when they did go there and when they did feed, it was nearly always on naturals. And I mean they'd feed hard as well, you know, like tails gripping the surface. They'd, they'd climb into the shallowest of water. In fact, a lot of the time, the spots that you, you might think were most likely for a bite, you know, the cleaner looking bits, sort of areas you'd be looking for all the time, you know, little dusty, clean bits that are longer than the length of an hook clink, you know, that you could lower in onto. Um, but that's not necessarily where they'd feed. They fed around the rubble. It was funny because, you know, all the land around it is open, f open fields, you know, with all the horses and that. And uh, I can remember watching the crows and the magpies, you know, and you'd watch them lifting over little bits of wood and sticks and branches and all that. A bit like us, you know, if, if, uh, if I sent you out to find some bugs, you'd go and look under the logs and stuff, you know, you'd know where to look for them. And those fish knew as well. So it, it was an area that was like a, a good pocket of natural food, you know, and those fish knew it, they'd go there to feed. But getting them to drop on bait, you know, that was really hard, and I sussed that from very early on. It seemed that the most subtlest of traps, you know, you could put in just half a handful of them, chew up half a dozen tigers and put it around it, and you'd be behind these willow trees, you'd have me, I'd have my old hat on and I'd be there hiding like, you know, and then suddenly one would appear, and he'd get level with the bait and they'd flinch, and flinch away from it. I think sometimes, little bits of twig and what have you would hold the line up. But an awful lot of the time, it wasn't that at all. It was the, it was the fact that it was a trap and they knew it was suspicious. They were that, that's not quite right. That wasn't there five minutes ago, that sort of thing. When you're faced with a situation when you've got like uh, tricky fish, you know, they're, they're well used to eating naturals. What's the first thing that most of us go to? It's a little bit of ant and a tiger in it, you know? But that's what I had to remember. I wouldn't be the first person who's done that. They were wary of that. But what's better? What can you use other than tigers and a little bit of emp, you know, in that sort of situation? And, you know, I'm not, I don't want to go into too much detail in this film because it, it, at the end it didn't really pay off, but um, casters, casters were a real, real good edge in that sort of situation. And I'm sure if I had stuck with them, they would have, would have done the business. But what you've got to think is, those fish could go three, four days at a time without being there. Could, could, might not be there for a whole session. Plus at that time of the year in the spring, the conditions were so changeable. You know, it was very hard for me to, to predict when I was going to need casters, when it was worth me paying a visit to the tackle shop and getting some casters. And, uh, you know, and as the, we had a real heat wave as well later on that spring and summer, you know, like trying to keep them fresh as well. But although I didn't do much with casters, I'm sure they would have caught them absolutely positive. Those rubber casters are really good. You know, you know how good a little bit of plastic corn is or something, you know, it stays on there forever, you've got no worries. And uh, I think people struggle to get their head around doing the same thing with a rubber caster. But I'm so confident I'd wang one out as a single. Like, you know, they really, really do work. Glue those together in a little, little stack. I've used them elsewhere and done really well on them. To be honest, I felt that tigers were probably the best way forward. It's just I had to change my approach and uh, and be a bit more subtle about it, even more subtle than I was already being. Conditions were still pretty changeable at that time in the spring, you know, so, so I had to keep an open mind. And there was one trip where I'd looked at the weather, I'd seen it was coming in, temperatures into the mid-twenties, so well warm, nice southwesterly, and I'd got in there 24 hours beforehand and uh, got all my traps set in the evening, you know, took my time over it, got up in the morning. Normally they'd hit the margin further up to my left, they'd bounce there along the old margin, and then they'd end up in my corner. Like I say, it got to midday-ish, early afternoon, and I took a walk down the bank and see three or four feeding further down the margin. And one of them was uh, the biggest common, real plump one, fat old thing he was. Getting a rig in was just virtually impossible, you know, like I needed to get a rig in beforehand. And also on my mind, I'm thinking, oh, the wind's still blowing down into my corner, you know, for all I know, I'm gonna move and then they're gonna end up exactly where I've just lifted out my preset traps. Got to about two, three in the afternoon, couldn't wait any longer. I reeled in the two right rods, and I was up a tree, I had both rods ready at the bottom and I had casters on them, little bags at the time, all ready to go. And I was up the tree and I'm watching these fish feeding. 
You know, you know what it's like when you've got four or five there feeding, two will swim off that way, and then you think, oh yeah, yeah, I can get in now, and you're just about to get down from the tree, and then two will come from that way. And, you could, and once you were down from the tree, you couldn't see any longer. You know, you, you get down from the tree, you think, yeah, that's okay, and you get down, and then it was just like a silver sheet of water. I couldn't see anything with a chop on it. Suddenly a buzzer's broke the silence. Bring, it's ripping off, like, and I legged it down there, um, hoping it was going to be that big common, because it disappeared at that time. Uh, and it turned out to be one of the smaller ones, like, you know, uh, about 16, 17 pound, dark old thing, probably just as old as the big one, you know, like the stunted old fish. But yeah, well comprised and another one out the edge and not too far from that pipe's corner as well. And even though they were the small ones, they were, every one was a prize, you know what I mean? When you've got a low stock of carp, every carp catches like a step closer. So I was chuffed. And another little boost to the confidence, it was on them tigers as well. Remember I'd caught the very first fish, that 27 common on tigers. Um, and the other, then, I, then a couple on the choddies, and then it was more edge fishing. Uh, but I'd seen those fish flinch away from tigers so many times that I had my doubts, you know. So to catch one, even though it was one of the smaller ones, to get one on the tigers, it lifted the confidence a bit. I haven't mentioned the bream up till now. There's a lot of bream in there, a lot of big bream and a lot of big tench. You know, I caught two doubles. I had a 10-5 and an 11-1. Um, biggest tench I've ever caught, you know. By accident, on the carp kit, but still pretty chuffed. I had a picture with them, put it that way. Some of the displays there were then bream, you, you just wouldn't believe it. You could have like two or three on the surface at the same time. And these bream are showing at about 70 yards. And I knew what they were showing over as well. I'd already fished the spot earlier on in the spring. Um, and I say that spot was a big area, it was like a plateau. Uh, come up to probably seven, eight foot with 15s around it, you know, like quite a raised feature. Another half hour it would have been dark, you know, but I've seen one slide out, a good and a common, in amongst the bream. I thought that'll do for me. I wanged it out of there, crack, bonk, lovely. And I remember being really tempted to ping a few boilies around it, but I didn't, you know. Um, I could have got 18 millers out there, but I didn't. I decided to just leave it a single. Went to bed that evening. Woke up, first thing I woke up to was a buzzer just absolutely one note in, you know, no, no mistaking it. You, you know, I had the clutch fairly tight as well and it's ripping. I picked up the rod, like I say, I'm fishing about 70 yards out. I picked up the rod, there's quite a lot of weed out there as well, but this fish was still free, it hadn't picked up any. It had gone beyond the feature and it's now it's over the back of it and my line was cutting left and right all the way out. It must have been from the furthest point left that it'd go to the furthest point right, it was about 70 yards at the same range. And for like probably the first three or four minutes of the fight, I never gained anything and I never gave anything. You know, it had no line off me and I gained nothing back. But I got the net into position, kept them coming like that. And then at the, at the very last minute, it sank down and I had a bush to my right. Water was quite up at the time as well, so there was quite a lot trailing into the water. But uh, yeah, unluckily it kited right. It just sunk down at the last minute, managed to get around the bush. I've got out as far as I can, but it's too late. And then it's grating. <laughs> So quickly, I put the rod down, went round the corner and walked out between a gap between the, the bush that it had gone round and the next bush. And I had my landing net pole, I always got two nets with me anyway, but I had one net and I had the landing net pole as well. And I fell in for the line, I got hold of the line like that. Then went underneath the bush, I got water going through, under, over the top of my waders. And I walked along the margin and there was one branch growing off the bottom. I, I was kicking myself really because I'd seen it before and really should have removed it. Um, but didn't think it'd be a problem. This one branch was coming out, and as I got level with it, I can see a, a whacking great common alongside it. It was one I recognised straight away. I'd seen it in the water a few times, and it had a, a bent peck, the right peck. If it was facing away from me, then that right peck was like folded. In hindsight, it was a, an old break from years before I was spawning or, or, or on the bank, maybe, who knows? Um, but really, really recognisable. There was no mistake in it and it had gone once round this branch and was bound up tight. The lead was against the branch and, and I've only got a nook link on that long. But the branch had a bit of give in it. You know, it's like the water's boiling and all that, you know, like it was beaten by this point. It wasn't like it was powering away from the branch, but it'd just go like that and the branch would give and then he'd bounce back and then it'd bounce forward again and the water was boiling. So I'm waiting between each one of those, those little lunges, if you like, to try and see what's going on. And it's all happening so fast and I've got the net, manoeuvred it underneath the branch like that. It's all boily and I can see, the, I touched it. At one point I had my hands each side of its flank and the landing it pole between my legs. And, and I remember just stopping for a, for a split second to see where the cord was because I couldn't lift the net. The branch was over the top of it, just one dead branch. 
and I'm just looking for the cord and at that moment it, its last little lunge if you like and instead of bouncing back it kept going and it just went straight over the top of the draw cord and I was like absolutely sick. You know, I knew exactly what it was. Um, in fact, it was, it was a fish that I'd seen a shot of the previous year and it was 38 pound then. So it wasn't one that I wanted to lose, you know. How I felt, I felt like I'd caught it and let it, let it go again, you know, because I actually had the net underneath it. The hope was that I'd get my own back on that one. But were you still seeing the mirror at this point? Yeah, I mean, they'd, they'd often be a very short window, small window, but whenever conditions come right, I would still see it around those pipes. And if I saw fish there, half a dozen carp, then the mirror would nearly always be one of them. You know, it, it wasn't quite tunnel vision at that point, but I knew that it liked that corner a lot. You know, you get to know the, be the best bits, where they like to feed most, you know, the best snuffling spots. And, and that mirror had one particular spot it really, really liked. When you've seen a fish tilt its head onto the same square foot of bottom, not once, not twice, but three, four times, that's a gift. You know, there's a lot of bottom out there, 25 to 30 acres. So when you see you've got, you've got one particular square foot that you know that barely a week could go by, you know, without that big and browsing across it at some point, that, that means a lot. I just knew, I just knew that I'd only need two or three bites off of that particular spot and one of them, would, would, there'd be a very, very good chance in the mirror amongst them. And what sort of time of the year were we talking about? Because obviously we've had the hottest summer you know, on record, was it starting to really warm up by then? Yeah, cooking, absolutely cooking. And that, in fact, that was one of the best, best parts about that, that corner of the lake. Um, as odd as it sounds, it was like it was air conditioned. And it's because of those tunnels. You know, you'd have a slight breeze blowing through the tunnels and it would cool it down. Quite literally air conditioning, just like getting in the car and putting on your air con. I'd made myself a little bit of a base camp, you know, in front of the very first pipe, first tunnel. And, uh, and from there I could, I had my old sounder box and I'll be honest, most of the time I fished one rod but if I wanted to, there was, there was, I had two gaps made. I had lots of visitors, visitors in that corner, you know, people that uh, they'd had enough of the heat wherever they was and they'd always pop round to see me because that was the air-conditioned spot. But you could go long periods without anything turning up in that part of the lake and that was one of the things that made it so frustrating, just the fact that it was so hard to predict. When I think back to the amount of chances I had, and you've got to think with each one of those chances, I might have been there for, for two days waiting for it. And then they turn up for, for an hour, but in that hour they'd absolutely smash it to bits. Naturals, always on the naturals. And then I'd just be left there, you know, head in my hands, like absolutely how, how have I not managed to catch one? I'll tell you how bad it got. You know, you've had it yourselves loads of times, I'm sure, when you've got fish feeding in the edge, you've managed to get a trap in, you know, sometimes I'd have it in well before they'd arrive. Manage to predict it. You know, it's like you get that feeling of confidence, it sweeps over you. You know, you've got your traps in, you've sat back, you put the kettle on, you think, right, it's just a matter of time. I'm just going to leave it now, it's in the hands of God. Let's just leave it and it, it's cert I'm certain it's going to go. But the amount of times that happened and it didn't go, in the end, whenever I had that feeling come over me, it was like, whoa, I've been here before. I know what's about to happen, absolutely nothing. And I even went through a little phase, there seemed to be a real, real big explosion of zebra mussels. And there was a, I had an old beer glass, like, you know, and I filled it up with mussels. Um, and I got a bit of wood and a brick and I smashed the load up and threw them all around the spot. And I put three little mussels, it was about that long, the little bait, put them on my hair, it looked mega. Like, you know, I thought, now I'm happy, I know what you're eating, you know. Because the cat, I could see from my own eyes, there was hardly any caddis anymore. Whether they ate those crushed mussels I put in or whether they ate stuff that was right next to them, I can't be sure. I felt that I really should have had a bite. Whereas before, I might have put in like half a handful of emp, never more than a handful, half a handful of emp straight on top of the hook bait with like half a dozen chewed nuts around it. Those little chewed nuts, they're quite blatant, you know, they, they, they get quite a lot of little white flecks. So that got down to eventually it was two tigers chewed up around it, do you know what I mean? Even less hemp. But how I caught the next one? That same amount of hemp, instead of putting it on the spot, I sewed it left and right, and I'm talking half a handful of hemp, but it covered a, a strip of bottom, probably 20 foot long. You know, like just a few grains there, a little bit there, a little bit there. Half of that tiger that I've just tooed up can go there. You know, I got really, really uh, careful. I was scared, almost paranoid, because I'd seen them flinch off the baited spot so many times. But over time, I ended up with two big lumps of chalk land on the bottom, that's what it was. And that was a good spot right next to the old chalk. Like, you know, they always fed around that, hence it had been dug out. Uh, and that's how that next one come. Um, no hemp around it, no freebies around it whatsoever. 
double tiger, two small tigers, lowered onto the spot, and any bait that I put in went left and right, just a tiny, tiny amount, that way and that way. And that came at first light, which was an unusual time as well. It wasn't often that I'd seen them in there at first light, but if I did, then they were there to feed. You knew that. They wouldn't be there for sunning themselves at that time of the morning. And that one, I actually saw it. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd got up, made myself a cup of tea, left the tea there. I I'd just have a quick look first. And I went, went around the corner, got up the tree, looked back in, and as I did, I actually saw one snake his way in. And it dropped down onto the spot. I doubt if it was on the spot 10 seconds. It come flying off the spot, shaking his head, and I'm getting down from the tree before it even bleached, you know what I mean? Legs it round the corner, it's one note in, another one of them little commons, you know? But that, that was pretty much the breakthrough. From that point on, I knew I'd use less bait. And I'm talking tiny, tiny amounts, pretty much a single, really. I remember the following trip after that, I started off doing the same thing, you know, like next, no bait around here at all. Um, but then I'd been tempted, and I remember regretting it. You know, once you put it in, you can't take it out. And even though it was a very small amount, you know, over the course of a couple of days, a couple of nights, I felt that it had built up. But I had a bit of luck there. I remember um, I'd gone for a stroll around the lake with a friend. Uh, the wind was blowing down the other end and it was hot, and cooking hot at this time. Once, whilst I was wrapped down the other end of the lake, I've looked back towards my corner. And there was four swans on the lake. Uh, the, the two adults and they're too young from the year before, which they failed to get rid of. You know, but all four swans were upended on the spot. And at first, you know, it's like, oh, sweat. and then I thought, actually, that's a good thing. You know, I wanted them to clear it out. Now, that same walkabout, I saw the big mirror and it was down my end of the lake. Not, not in my corner, not in my bay, but in another bay closest to the car park. And it was sat there sunning itself. There was someone fishing in that corner. But as I passed, I'd seen it sat there. And whenever I'd seen him in that bay, like I say, it was up, it was probably, oh, easily 200 yards from my corner, but when it was still down my end of the lake, you know, and that was significant. I knew that whenever they used that, there was every chance they, they, at a later time in the day, they'd go to my corner. So I trotted back there, around there pretty quick. I had to wait for the old swans to, to, to bugger off and the water to clear and put my waders on. Rig was all ready to go. Got my waders on, took a couple of steps out and the colour was dropping out of the water from them swans feeding. And I could see that they dusted off a new bit Everything was improving by this time as well. There was weeds starting to grow up on the bottom in that corner. All of the bottom looked good. I'm sure I could have just lowered a rig in blind in the middle of the night and it would have been fishing, you know? But when you can see it all, you still tend to choose the very, 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 very best snuffle spots, don't you? And I remember lowering into it, onto it. Done it two or three times, you know? Like even the length of the hook clink was, was enough for it to fall different to where you wanted it. But I got it so that the, the hook bait settled exactly where I wanted it. And as, as the ripples cleared and I'm looking and all that, and I could see that the lead was sat upright. I was tying the leads on, but I could see it was sat upright. I hadn't laid down where I've just lowered off the tip. So I had to take a couple of steps back and there was the odd little twig on the bottom. So I laid the lead core perfectly so it was flush to the bottom. And then once I had the tip down low and I was back a bit, I just gave it a little tweak, you know, but I'm watching the hook bait all the time. I didn't want that hook bait to move and the hook point to blunt and, you know, but I had to lay that lead flat. I just gave it a little tweak put the rod on the rest and then walk back out there again and I could see it was all flush, it was all perfect, tight to the bottom. Trap set. Because of that bird life, the swans in particular, I'd got into a habit of setting my alarm and getting up real early. And I had it set for five o'clock. As it happened, I woke up to a much better alarm call at 10 to. And the first thing I thought when I swung my legs off the bed, I could hear the old, the old sounder box warbling. The first thing I thought was them blimmin' swans, you know? But just in those split seconds that it took to slip the trainers on, you know, when it's just too steady, too consistent. Du, 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 du. You know, you can't hear the proper buzzer, but I could hear that remote going. And got my shoes on, legged it round the corner, and the rock was just poking through the foliage, you know, with a, it should have had a slack line hanging off the tip. And the line's held up tight and the clutch was still ticking just slowly. It really hadn't taken that much line, it probably only had sort of five, ten yards at most, you know. Um, and to begin with, I had to play it kneeling down because of the overhang, the willows, the trailers overhang by quite a long way. But yeah, um, I probably only had it on for about 30 seconds, minute maybe at most, before the lead core broke the surface. So it really hadn't taken much line at all. And at this point, I'm not sure, you know, I, I was struggling to get a gauge of how big a fish it was because with every, every lunge, I'd gain a bit of line light, you know, it was just sort of bouncing and then I'd gain a bit. But the lead core's come out of the water and at that point, I've shuffled forward quickly. The water was quite down, so there was a bit of a drop, a second level, if you like. I could drop down a level. And I've dropped down a level, 
kept the tension up all the time. And at that same moment, the lead core is now fully out of the water. At that same moment, a big black box bobbed up to the surface with a gnarly old dorsal on it. Do you know what I mean? And it's like cough, and it's there. And I just grabbed the net, it all happened so quick. Kicked off my shoes, didn't have time to take my socks off. Kicked off my shoes, just took two steps out into the lake and into the net it went. I honestly don't think it even had time to wake up. Barely knew what was going on. Well, it seemed mad. It seemed like one minute I was asleep and the next I was staring at a big chocolate coloured mirror in the net. Let's be honest, that moment, you know, when you're looking at the one that you wanted, the one that you've been looking at pictures, you know, all, all winter, I was looking at shots of that fish over and over again, and there it is in the net, you know, it's the reason we do it, isn't it? That's why we do it. There's carp and there's carp. How's that for a carp, eh? <laughs> 39 11. That'll do me. <laughs> right, it's very warm. 33 degrees today, so I'm not going to hang about. I'm going to get him back pretty quick. He's an old fish. Look at that. Big smacker. Thanks, old boy. Always hang on to him for a bit in this hot weather, but he's okay. Off he goes. That'll do. I, I mean, I was chuffed to bits. That was Lord of the Lake. That was the number one prize to me, that mirror, you know, and I would have been, been happy to walk away then. But I didn't have a lot else to go, anywhere else to go to at that point anyway, not immediately. Um, and I still wanted revenge on that common. I thought, no, I'm going to have two or three more trips and see how it goes. I think I said to you at the time, let's leave it a little bit. We won't do the film just yet, because you never know, I might have a chance of that old bent peck. Um, didn't expect it to be the very next bite, though, and off the very, the very same spot as well. You know what it's like. First thing you do is you look in that net, don't you? And I went straight to the recognisable feature, was that, which was that peck, that old floppy peck. And I had that in my hand and I could see it. I knew what he was, you know, that was the one. So not only had I caught the, the one that I wanted most, the big mirror, but I'd got my revenge on the one that had got away and all. And so that was pretty much it, the end of an adventure. I was over the moon with them too, you know, like the mirror was obviously the number one target to get one of the two commons, especially the one that I'd earlier lost. That was the right result. And I knew what I was leaving one or two behind, you know, they wasn't the only nice looking carp in there, there was other good ones, but you can't catch them all. There was something though that I just couldn't leave behind. I said to you earlier about how those carp like to feed all around the rubble. I mean, they're, they're, you know, it wasn't just rubble, there was cars and, and God knows what in there, you know, that particular corner, it had a toilet, an upside down toilet on the edge, there was a transit van, uh, upturned barrels, you know, the, the, the lake was full of backfill, you know, but there was two things there, well there was three of them, and they were stone garden pelicans. Like, you know, why they were in the lake, who'd thrown them in there, I don't know. But just like the carp like to feed all around the rubble, they like to feed around them stone pelicans as well. So two of them had to come home with me. I'm a real, I, I like a souvenir, you know, my garden's full of souvenirs. I've got like rocks from the Big S and uh, water mint from Ashmead, you know, and the whole garden's got odds and ends. So, I'd had my eye on them pelicans for a long time. So before I left, they went on the old barra, tripped back to the car, and they now got a new home in my garden.